Okay, I am speaking with Dan Russo. We have spoken twice before. Once was about a year and a half or two years into the, the economic meltdown. Uh, we spoke in, in late 2009. The second time we spoke was right in the middle of the debt ceiling crisis in the summer of 2011. And now here we are um, almost exactly one month out from the election of 2012. Uh, with what seems to be a quite volatile electorate. Um, so to start, can you just tell me how, and, and if you want to speak in personal terms about you know your own kind of outlook and preferences, that's fine too. But I'm going to start with more of a structural question of, you know, from your desk, you know, at a financial institution in New York City, um, what... What does this moment look like, both economically and politically? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, I guess I'll take the um, uh, I'll take the political point of view uh, first. And I think what's interesting politically about the here and now is that the uh, the financial industry seems to be um, much more um, focused and much more committed to supporting conservative financial politics or Republican type candidates than they were four years ago and I think some of that has to do with the obvious facts that uh, Dodd-Frank and all of the regulatory legislation which has been passed, which needs to be detailed, which is forthcoming in terms of its implementation, has such a significant effect on the industry that almost everybody in the industry has felt the negative impact of that legislation in some way. So I think what you have is you have a group of people who are feeling that their career path is different, feeling that their career path is uh, much more uh, difficult. And I think for just, you know, kind of personal and obvious reasons, they are inclined not to support an administration that they believe, that they perceive to be the cause of the um, regulatory uh, changes. And, you know, we can talk about and discuss and probably debate whether or not that perception is even completely accurate. Uh, but it, it, in fact, is the consensus perception. And for that reason, I think that um, the industry seems to be very uh, supportive. Uh, I, I also think there's something else going on. I think that four years ago, it wasn't very industry specific and it wasn't very uh, economically specific to want a change, to want a new paradigm, to want um, a uh, administration that was marketing um, a new, you know, sort of political process. They were marketing a f more fair political process. They were marketing a more um, honest, a more uh, thoughtful, a more constructive uh, political process, and one that uh, didn't comp support uh, crony-type capitalism. And I think there were a lot of people, regardless of your industry, regardless of your uh, socioeconomic strata that, that believed that the, the prior administration had behaved in ways that they weren't uh, proud of and that they didn't feel was appropriate and that um, they... So, so I guess generally people were willing, willing to move a little bit more um, to the middle from the right. And I think that the last four years and um, some of the um, rhetoric and the process and the legislation, whether it's healthcare legislation, whether it's banking legislation, um, you know, I think the employment picture, economic growth, 
uh, global currency crisis, all of these things have pushed people more to, to the right, even if they're not specifically in the financial industry. So I think you have this very, very divided electorate and, and, and so polarized, and I don't necessarily think that's where we were four years ago. We had many other issues, but I don't necessarily think we were as polarized as we are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So can you, um, for a, a lay person, um, describe the calculus of people in your industry or, or just in the financial sector more broadly. Um, you're talking about the huge emphasis on questions of regulation. Oh, by the way, we never touched the, the economics. Well, we can come back to that. We're coming we back to that. Back to that. Although yeah. I think that this is related. Um, you know, you, you just laid a really heavy emphasis on, on regulation and what it will mean for the industry, or what it does mean, what it has meant, okay. what, what people perceive it to mean. Can you just describe in more detail, though, how the thinking goes? Like, what is the calculus of, of those kinds of regulatory questions weighed against both um, the behavior of the market, for example, that's one thing, um, but just the, the general turnaround of the economy over the last four years? Like, how does, how does someone kind of think themselves through those economic issues and still come down on, on reg the regulation question being the most important thing about... Um, do you understand the question? I don't know that I do. I, I, think, I think what you're saying is, is we were at a crisis point. It's the behavior of the lack of regulation that had an impact on creating the crisis point. We managed through the crisis point. It was very expensive. It was, in some respects, not fair to put so much onus on the entire U.S. tax population for this the, the anti-regulatory behavior that created the crisis point. So now, how could anyone, you know, kind of get there with any sort of logic to a point where they don't want regulation? Is that... Well, that's that's, that, that's 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 one piece of it, but that okay. isn't that isn't specifically what I was asking. Although okay. I think that that's that's um, worth talking about too. More, what I was asking is, um, you know, if you look at where the market was uh, right around the election of yeah. two thousand eight, and when you look at where it is now, yeah, when you look at what was happening in the corporate sector in two thousand eight, and you look at corporate profits over the last many quarters. You know, from the outside of the industry, um, it's very easy to ask the question, like, what does Wall Street want? Yeah. yeah and yeah. so what I'm, I, I guess, actually have friends who work in Washington and are close to the administration who ask the same question. Uh, you know, what, 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 what do you, what, we don't get it. I, I, okay, so a couple things. <clears throat> where we were in 2008 and early 2009 versus where we are today... Um, you know, I, I think without a doubt that the um, kind of significant and um, uh, brave and risky sort of decisions that we had to make um, uh, in terms of um, kind of stimulating the economy, backstopping a lot of these too big to fail institutions and creating sort of global confidence in the U.S., uh, you know, m market system. I, I think that that was clearly the most important event um, to happen in order for us to kind of put some building blocks together again and, and have um, a reasonably constructive uh, economic environment with a pr reasonably healthy market. Um, you mentioned earlier, too, what happened last summer in the summer of 2011 and, and, and how difficult it was for um, for the markets globally to endure all of the uncertainty around not extending the um, debt ceiling and, uh, and and having some of these issues still still coming up um, so I, I mean I, I think I think the reason why um, I, the market is not I mean generally what the reason why people in this industry because I think this is a question that's being asked um, feel that the regulatory um, framework is unfair and is is overreaching and is aggressive 
and is going to cause some dysfunction. I think the reason they believe the, that, and I also think the reason they believe that the administration is not um, is not focused on improving the economy, um, has a lot to do with income. It has a lot to do with, and it's not necessarily just their income. I think if you look at incomes in the United States across every single category, they are down in real terms and they are frankly not growing and in many cases they're down in absolute terms. Uh, I think when you look at the amount of people, regardless of where they are at in the income spectrum that are out of work, I think when you absolutely look at GDP growth and you look at what's needed to grow and you know whether we're growing at one three, one seven, one four, we're growing sub two percent. And I think anytime you're growing sub two percent you need to grow three to stimulate employment and I think when you look at where the corporate profit improvement has come from, and it's largely from cutting overhead, and it's largely from laying people off, and it's largely from below the line, so to speak, the actual revenue growth that's um, so uh, necessary to create a um, kind of healthy market environment, a healthy economic environment that we're all kind of grasping at. I think it's that. I think it's the... It's this concept of we've come an incredibly long way. Thank God all of that happened. But so much time has passed that we as a country and we as an, an economy should be in the position now to put us back into a growth curve that was more consistent with the two decades prior to the crisis. And I think Could I'm any- not sure that you can lay it at the administration's doorstep and say it's your fault. I'm not sure that you can say that it isn't the fault of the administration. The truth is is in there, though. It's in there. It's, it's a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. One of the things that has been really striking to me, especially, um, well, I think especially in the last couple of weeks, and, and we're speaking at a moment where, you know, 10 days ago, I think everyone in the world thought that Obama was going to walk away with this thing. Yeah. And now, a lot of people on both sides feel that that actually might not be true at all. Yeah. It's totally up for grabs, or it seems to be. I think, you know, we'll see. I think, you know, we're a month out and a lot, obviously a lot is going to happen, and, happen and, and it's very volatile. But one of the things that's really striking to me, and I think that this is one of the most important economic statistics that I've seen over kind of, that just explains something um, that has a long tail to it in, in um, recent U.S. economic history, and that was that between, between 1945 and 1970, um, productivity increased by 100%, and, and wages increased by r- almost 100%. They increased by 90-something percent. And in the decades since then, productivity has increased another 100%, and wages have increased about 4%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is you know, where you start to see the, the disparity. I think that's the point. The disparity, right. And that was something that was not discussed in our politics at all really until very, very recently. And I mean, almost until the Occupy movement. I mean, I think that, that the, the collapse in, in 07, 08 started the discussion. I think that the Occupy movement really pushed it forward to, in, to a place where it occupies it as a, as, as a topic of discussion, occupies a very different position than it ever has in our, in our politics for generations, for two generations. Yeah. If you had asked me to guess whose favor that was going to be in, I would have said Obama's. Suddenly, it seems to me like... That's curious. Because there's a kind of impatience, right? The, the impatience that he has not turned this around. Here's, here's the catch. So if, if real wages haven't grown, or they've grown so modestly from whatever it is, 74 until 12, frankly, the last three years, they really, they're, they're down. And... Um, and you have this global growth situation, which is putting demand on so many things, which we know about. So, you know, whether inflation captures this or not, people it costs people more just to just to just to exist, just to buy basics. So there's this big delta between income and and and, and your overhead. And I think there are people in the middle of the income curve who, throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, felt like okay, as long as I'm working and productive, I can meet my family's needs. That, that is no longer the case. So there's this, there's this whole generation uh, of disenfranchised middle class. 
And then on top of that, there's this whole generation of 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 lower middle class to lower class income or, or unemployed who who have actually no like no no roadmap right. to get there. And now we have 47 million people on some sort of government subsidy with respect to food or whatever and, and we have so I mean it's we got this huge bifurcation and I think there are a lot of people in the middle who are feeling like well I actually was a little better when uh, you know when, when, Re when Reagan was around and I was a little better in the first term of Bush and, and, I, was, and I was definitely better in Clinton and Clinton was more of a conservatively minded Democrat when it came to fiscal policy and when I look at and I listen and I hear, you know, the deficit is growing by a trillion dollars a year and I hear that, you know, we're never going to be able to meet the interest expense and I hear that, you know, it's borrowing from China that is really the dollars that are supporting the 47 million people who are, you know, on government kind of subsidy. I, I say, well, something's broken. And, and I'm not, it's so complicated and it's so kind of convoluted that I'm not sure I can figure it out as a middle class, you know, moderate wage earning American. So I'm inclined to once again want what I don't have in the same way that, in part, the, what got me to Obama was wanting what I didn't have. Right. So I think it's not, I think it's a referendum on what's going on, not on what they think right. he can do. Right. So let me ask you this. Um, a two-part question. One, I don't know if I got to your answer, by the way. Well, no, I think I think actually that you did. Although I still see, I personally see it as an irony. I see. I yeah, say, I don't I, follow you. So you're saying the fact that wages are down. Well, here's what I'm saying. I'll just, I'll just put it very simply. That what I'm suggesting is that 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 Mitt Romney, of all people, just who he is, what he embodies, yep. and his policies, that he would be recognized at this moment as a savior for the questions that you've just been talking about right. for the last five minutes, right. I think is ironic. Do you think it's ironic? I actually don't. I think it really goes right smack dab back to what capitalism means. And capitalism, at its core, is about an entrepreneurial spirit. It is about risk-reward. It is about growth. It is about um, it, it is about having an opportunity to class hop, having an opportunity through a generation or two to change your personal balance sheet, your personal capital structure, your ability to create the, in this country, your ability to create some sort of affluent lifestyle is unmatched in the world. Uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, but. It's kind of unmatched. There are places clearly where you could do do similar, but historically it's been unmatched. So I think some of what happens when government grows and subsidies increase and the overhead to manage that process falls on the tax base, there is this natural rejection of that policy. I, so mm -hmm. I don't see the irony. Uh -huh. it, I, think, I think whether Mitt Romney is in fact this pillar of capitalism and he can you know, get it to, to work its way down the, you know, the uh, income spectrum, that, that, is, that, that remains to be seen. And maybe that's the point of why you think it's ironic because you know a fair amount about him and you might be saying, you know, give me a break. There's no way that he's going to deliver what people perceive him to be able to deliver. But I'm not surprised that people um, want a kind of another chance at bootstrapping themselves. I think there's a lot of people who are stuck in, 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 in certain career paths and income curves, and they see absolutely no opportunity for them to improve their income next year or the year after that, the year after that. And I think that does a job to, um, to the kind of family psyche. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... Two-part question. Um, as someone who you really have your your finger on the pulse of the economy minute to minute in in the work that you do, and you have to, um, as this as whether it turns out to be the first Obama term or the only Obama term, whatever it is, uh -huh. how would you describe the kind of economic trend line or or trend lines? Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the like the important indicators that that you think about. 
how would you describe the four years that, that are just now coming to a close? And then the second part, and this is kind of a playful question because nobody can know, but, but given what you know about the two policy packages that are being put on the table, what would your expectation be for the next four years um, given right. in the two different scenarios? I think that's the right question, by the way. And I don't necessarily think that I don't necessarily think people are being completely honest or fair about the economy that has been that we've lived under uh, under Obama. Because I, don't, you know, I, I do think that there was so, such a crisis uh, that was that was handed to this administration that many of the decisions they made in those first twenty four months were out of their hands. And I think the cost of those decisions and the impact on those decisions, the impact from those decisions. It's 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 almost the overarching f- fact of where we are today. I mean, th- th- those decisions. So, you know, being fair, uh, the the economy relative to what we went through and what they had to do, I think, is stable, and I think um, is on a much much better foundation. And I think is, um, I classify it as okay. I classify it as okay. What we've seen is that we've had more of a market share war uh, within most industries. Let's just put healthcare and energy, you know, aside because there's, you know, A, there's regulatory change in one and B, there's this, you know, enormous cyclical and secular change in another. But yeah, I think it's okay, and I, I think that what you've seen is that really good operators have gotten better and taken share from really bad operators, so or even mediocre operators. So the competitive forces that exist in capitalism are working. Um, but I would tell you that it's anything um, uh, but you know robust and strong and very healthy, and um, we are not in a rising tide type of an environment where. You know, kind of all boats get lifted a little bit, and you know, and I think that there are a lot of businesses, and there are a lot of market participants, and a lot of retirees, and a lot of pensions, and a lot of endowments, and a lot of these, you know, types of uh, situations that need some level of rising tide in order to meet their future obligations. And when they start doing the the calculations and the math on how they're going to get there. Uh, I think that's when the anxiety sets in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So then, looking ahead to a Romney future, looking ahead to a Obama yeah, I future, I will tell you that there are a lot of people who are smarter than me that say the next two or three years, the economy is going to be much better, almost regardless of who's president. And much of that has to do with QE1, QE2, and now QE3, which is open-ended. And an open-ended stimulative monetary policy is unprecedented. You know, the fact that the Fed uh, is basically telling uh, the markets that they will keep rates at this level, which is extremely low historically and virtually free money, for as long as necessary, and then some, so that we can see an actual recovery, we can see a bottoming of growth, and some level of growth that's more stimulative, they're going to leave rates there, implying that sometime in 14 or 15 when the economy is growing at 25 or 3% and the employment rate is back down in the mid-single digits, then they might start to, you know, to raise rates and slow us down. I mean, I think that is, is the single most important thing to look at when you kind of look out at the next 24 months and say, is the economy going to get better? Well, we're, we're so far off the cliff in terms of you know, deficit spending and, and, and kind of stimulative that, that if we don't keep going, there, there is no turning back because the only way you manage the other side of this debt problem is through pretty robust growth. Uh, and you try to deflate your currency. So um, that answers that in part. Uh, relative to each other, Obama versus Romney, um, you know, look, I'm biased on this topic. I actually think that Mitt Romney is better in the purest sense for uh, economic growth and for the economy from here. And the reason I believe that is because there are 
things that are happening with respect to the fiscal cliff and the uh, Bush tax cuts that are scheduled to change over the next 12 months. And I think Romney will take a different approach to some of those than will the current administration. I think that um, some of the cost of running a government this large, and there seems, I will criticize the administration on this front, there seems to be no acknowledgement nor willingness to reflect upon how large this particular government has become and how expensive it is to manage a government that is this large and how many things the government is taking on. And I think Romney made a very good point of this. That should be managed by the states. And I know there's a logic that, look, when you give it to the states, it gets you know, convoluted and you don't reach your desired outcome and the states, you know, eat off that revenue and it and and if the and if we take it in and we manage it at the federal level, it's gonna it's gonna work better. It's gonna it's gonna get to more people and the system's gonna have ultimately higher productivity. I'm not sure there's any evidence of that and that certainly isn't the way we've always done it in the past. And um so I don't know. That's kind of a long-winded answer to saying I think that you know we will we will reduce overhead at the federal level. We will put more onus back on states to manage a lot of these social programs. We'll be more selective with social programs, and I know that's not a popular idea across the entire spectrum. And, and I think you got to be incredibly careful because everybody has a point of view on education, on military spending, on other you know, government programs, and uh, and that's a tough one. But I think that he'll be more aggressive, and that might make him more unpopular. Uh, and I also think that he'll look at some of the changes that have happened to health care and look at some of the changes that have happened to the financial industry regulatory-wise and be more thoughtful and actually give more consideration to people who are in those positions to kind of, talk about how it how it works after after the regulation goes into effect and i feel like this administration was so pissed off at, at, at some of these industries after the crisis and they felt so disenfranchised and underappreciated that they just it became a polarizing event and and they weren't willing to to consider um you know kind of maybe i'm you know biased but so that's where i stand mm -hmm. um People on both sides, I mean, the whole tenor of this election season has been that that we could quite possibly be heading for disaster, right? One person's disaster is another person's, you know, hopeful outcome. But, so disaster with respect well, to just, the economy or... Well, just, you know, the Romney folks are saying, not only should you have preferences for for us and this approach, but that it will be disastrous if yeah. Obama is reelected. Yeah. And Obama and that camp is saying this would be disastrous. It yeah. would be the end of yeah. America as we know it yeah. if Romney is elected. Right. You seem to be saying something different. I don't think that either. I and think so. Well, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. my that's, question, that's, that's, that's exactly right. I don't think. I think the fear component is is crucial to marketing a candidate. So the, yeah. So my question is really a kind of a process one. Which has to do with, I mean, first of all, the way we are running our, our campaigns and elections now, does, is there any fruitful substantive debate that is taking place? Are, are voters getting a chance to hear the things that they really need to be hearing? By and large, no. By and large, no. And, and, I th you know, and so, well, it, like, if... And the super PAC, I mean, creating these PAC has, 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 has I think, um, exacerbated the inability of the basic electorate to, to get at the, you know. Um, the debates are great. They only go so far. They're probably the be best mechanism that I see. I think that we are so polarized in terms of the media and we are so polarized in terms of the, um, uh, the rest of the political process and the way the capital is, 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 is raised and the way that, that these candidates are getting marketed. And I think substantively they're different, um, but I don't know that they are as different as they want everyone to believe. They each of them, you know. I I, I think that you know this. It's a referendum on the on the rest of on the on the country like never before in the history of time. I, and I just I'm not completely sure that is that is the case. 
I believe if we continue down the path of bigger government, higher taxes, more subsidy, and and, and, and increased deficit spending. I mean, if we continue down that path, I don't think there's anybody on either side of the aisle that wouldn't say that that has um, a significant long-term price. And I think that the long-term price of that means that we, at some point, could lose our inability to be the reserve currency, could lose our ability to be the greatest uh, kind of military power, could lose our ability to have a, have a front and center position with all sort of world geopolitics. I don't think that we're within two years, five years, ten years, twenty years of that, but that, that path gets you there. So, you know, I think stopping... Um, you know, that and and kind of taking a breather and saying, okay, let's, you know, let's kind of take care of the capital structure question and let's stop the deficit spending and let's let's start to look within a little bit and and stop this runaway freight train. Uh, I think that's a smart, I think that's a smart thing to do. I would think it's a smart thing to do whether Romney was the guy at the helm or not. Mm-hmm. I think it's a smart thing to do. So that's what that's really I think what's going to be different. Um, it's interesting because there's a chance that if you kind of keep the tax code where it is, you don't improve it, you don't you don't you don't hurt, you don't change it. You just kind of keep it where it is, which is somewhat implied in Romney's rhetoric, and you kind of at some point stop the stimulative. You know, kind of uh, monetary policy, and you start to really get the engine of growth to work organically. That that actually is a less positive outcome for people in year two or three of this administration than if we kept on the Obama path. So, um, you know, I I don't know. I don't know. Well, which brings me to one of my other questions, and this is really closely related to the process question about the electoral season and the way it's run. Um, the question of governance. Do you have confidence that the next president, whoever it is, is actually going to be able to govern, hmm. given the level of polarization and given the... Um, not just... I mean, well, there's a kind of emotional polarization... There's a policy polarization. There's a procedural polarization. I mean, there. This is a I, fraught I, moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I, I mean, I really, I think, I, I think so. I mean, if you if you take a step back, you know, more things are the same than they are different. More things are the same. You know, I think that that there still is. A very good educational opportunity for people if they seek it out. Now that's not universal, and it's not available to everybody. And I think we have to do so much <clears throat> better. But I think that it's still there on some level, and I think that people still have opportunity. They have opportunity to start businesses. They have opportunity to start professional careers. They have opportunity to start small businesses. They have opportunities. Um, and I think I think that. Yeah, I think someone will be able to govern. I think uh, an administration will be able to govern. I don't, you know, I don't think it's, I think this is just how it, how it is. I think as time goes on and economies around the world become more skilled in their labor force, economies around the world become more developed in terms of their wage and consumption and discretionary consumption um, picture, it changes the dynamics for very developed countries. I don't think it's that much different than Western Europe, and and I think that that that's a really good window into some of the things that happen if you are not responsible around your national capital structure. I think some of what's going on in Western Europe is. I want to live a very developed national 
lifestyle, and I want to lead a very developed national kind of economic process. And because the process is a function of people, you know, it's a democratic process, so therefore the democracy continues to create its own immediate benefit, and that immediate benefit is sometimes the very thing that undoes you. And so maybe that's the question you're getting at is, are we now at a point where there are so many people who are so entrenched in their own agenda that whoever puts the administration in gets fed the agenda that they want and that becomes somewhat circular in terms of never actually accomplishing the very things that need to be accomplished, which are actually like you know taking cough medicine. They're hard. They're, they, no one wants to swallow this. And I think, I think on some level we're all guilty of that. It doesn't matter if you're particularly liberal or, 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 and, and very left of center or if you're particularly conservative or very right of center. At the end of the day, everybody, all the, all the people who are in the political process are guilty of that on some level. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a real issue. I, 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 I suspect um, that, um, I hope that, you know, reason wins the day, and I hope that at the end of the day, people are um, are true. But you know, I, I think I think that that's that is a little bit um, it is a little bit unrealistic to want. You know, mm-hmm. I recognize how I recognize how that sounds. I, I know I know how that sounds, and it sounds it sounds almost Pollyannish. And it's well, uh, I, I interviewed somebody once who said. The most important things that happen in this country actually happen above, above. This is his phrase: above the pay grade of the president. That that the president is a nice administrative office that can kind of steward the existing. But you know, if you want to get to where like the real decisions are made, they actually are not made there. Do you agree with that? I think on a lot of fronts, yeah. I think I think that um, you know I don't think that's true militarily. I don't think that's true geopolitically. I don't think that's true um, with respect to social services. I don't think that's true. I think it's very true when it comes to um, global trade. Uh, And I think it's probably very true when it comes to, um, you know, the economy. You know, but, uh, you know, case in point, this administration did not, uh, feel politically inclined to um, approve, you know, certain pipelines, certain energy projects, certain things along the way, and there were people at very, very high levels who would, in theory, be in that group of people who make things happen and push that down to the administration and to the White House. So there is an exception, I still think, to that. And Look, I actually think this president is willing to um, go toe to toe with a lot of uh, constituencies that that have that much uh, sort of power, and um, it remains to be seen whether or not Mitt Romney is the kind of guy that will go to toe to toe with some of that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I think that you know that's that's a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. I don't I don't yeah. know the answer. It it sounds to me like you think Romney's going to win. Well, I don't know. I actually don't think he's going to win. Um, I still, I still am kind of in that fifty-one forty-nine uh, Obama camp in, t- in terms of how I think it's going to play out. Um, but I, I suspect that if he has a couple of more debates that go very well, and I suspect if the president doesn't come out in the next couple of weeks and talk about his. Uh, framework for managing through the fiscal cliff that, that kind of starts early next year, and uh, I, I think it's his. I think he's got a real shot. I guess that's what I'm saying. I think he's got a real shot. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. you know, if if he did win, it wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, a huge huge surprise to me at this point. And uh, and if he did win, how do you think Obama would be remembered? Ooh, that's a that's a really hard question. You voted for Obama. I voted for Obama. I I um, I had not voted Democrat really in any election. 
that I can remember prior. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think, I think at the core that he is a guy who really believes strongly in what he's doing. And I think he operates with a, uh, you know, a, a moral framework that is um, genuine. And I, I have a lot of respect for that. And that's what I was attracted to. And I also, I think at that point, I was absolutely uh, embarrassed and ashamed of uh, some of the, the, the things that, uh, that, that, that W. had done in his second administration, some of the things he had said, some of the ways he had behaved, the way we were being perceived nationally. And I think um, there were other people inside of that party that I just I could not um, accept in terms of the way that they uh, approach problems, decisions, and things like that. So I was ready for a change. Uh, and I think the country was ready for a change. And I think we wanted any change. And I think that there was this notion that you were going to get all of that and the bag of chips. And I don't even know that that was a realistic thing to want. Um, never mind a realistic thing to for anyone to have delivered. Um, and frankly, he didn't deliver. He did not deliver all of that. And I don't think it was fair or realistic. Uh, how is he going to be remembered um, you know, I think he's going to be remembered as uh, probably not as positively as might be fair. Um, and uh, I think if he were to, you know, kind of uh, lose the election, I think he's going to be remembered as a guy who tried and failed at um, at at getting uh, at getting the country uh, through this period of time. And uh, again, I don't know that that's the right. That's the right way to think about it. Yeah. I don't know. How do you think he's going to be remembered? Um, I think it completely depends on this election. I think that if he loses... In well, that was the question. Yeah, it was. I think if he loses in 2012, he will not... Over the long run, I don't think he will be thought of as another Jimmy Carter. But I think he'll be on a spectrum. He'll, he, he won't be remembered as a, an FDR or a Ronald Reagan. You know, um, I, it's hard to know. I mean, the the level of vilification still is shocking to me, and and that could overtake him in history too. You know, depending on what what, I, it's, it's it's hard yeah. to know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Um, is there anything that from our vantage point in in October twenty twelve that we haven't talked about that you would like to? Mm. No, I mean we talked we talked a little bit about where kind of the industry that I work in was politically. I think that was one of the questions. I think we talked a little bit about the economy, which is you know kind of in, in no man's land. You know we're 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 stable, we're growing slowly, and if we were to remain at this level, we would not be able to overcome some of the incremental debt that we've piled on in order to stimulate to get us here. So we kind of need to ratchet that up so that, you know, the power of you know, Keynesian economics works. You know what? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of chuckle because it's like, uh, you know, I don't think that uh, any sort of modern economic theory has ever been put quite to this test. Um, and you know, and, and no, other than that, I mean, okay. whatever the markets are where they are, and we'll see. I'm gonna throw one last one because I remember three years ago, the first time we spoke on tape, you, um, the first question I asked was just a broad question about, about, um, I think I just couched it in, in a phrase as ambiguous as the moment we're in now. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you mentioned was not anything I was expecting. You mentioned global warming. Mm. Does that continue to be a concern of yours, and and is that something that you think about? No, I think that's a good question. It is. Um, I think it is absolutely a concern. I um, and I think that uh, I think that it's not front and center for. Um, for a lot of reasons, and I don't think any of them 
are good enough to not keep it front and center. Right. I mean, that might be the, the issue for I thinking know. about the ways that our process fails us, actually. Yeah. But in any case... I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point. And I think that goes back to your earlier point. Can anyone really govern and accomplish the things that a government is truly there to accomplish? You know, government is not designed to create monetary policies so that everybody can continue to feel great. I mean, that's not, you know, that's not what they, that's not, that's not what, you know, the, the Constitution was, was designed around. It was... Right. It was well, that's one of the things yeah. that also cracks me up about the Tea Party is that, you know, original intent is all fine and good, but nobody in, 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 you know, in the 1770s was, in, was imagining, you know, 350 million people, right. you know, so... Anyway, well, thank you very much no for this conversation. Station. 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 Station.